problem number three, it says based on figure two of the onion root tip cells were in mitosis. The proportion that were in the prophase was closest to which of the following. Make sure that you go ahead and underline everything important. One, figure two. Then we want to go ahead and underline prophase. And then we're looking for the proportion. Okay, so what we do is just simply go up there. Let's point. Your right hand should be on figure two. Let's go up there. So when we come over, take a look at figure two. All right, here it is here. And then we want to find prophase. Simply go over here to prophase, column number one. Go up. It looks like it's 305. Okay, so that's how many are in prophase, but that's just a portion of what you have in figure two. So what we have to do is we have to add up the rest of these columns here. So we have 305 plus... We have 25 plus we have 45 and plus we have 125. When you add that up, you see that we have a total of 500. So what's the proportion? Prophase is 305 and the total is 500. And that will lead you to the correct answer here, which is going to be answer choice D. Problem number four, which cell in figure three is the first phase of mitosis? Okay, first thing we're going to do is underline what's important. Figure three, underline that. We're going to underline mitosis, all right? Now, when you come back over here, here's figure three, okay? And when I look over here at figure three, this is what I see. First phase of mitosis. Um, okay, so and, I don't know. Yikes, get it kids? Yikes means we need to finger scan. So what do we do? We go right back up to the mini introductory paragraph here and you're gonna see a pirate flag right there. You see it, however. Now, when you read this, however, the cells are not arranged in order of the phases of mitosis. What's the word we're looking for when we finger scan? Mitosis, and you saw a pirate flag. So now you know it's not arranged in order. That means cell one is not the first stage of mitosis. This is cell division, and cell division means it's breaking apart or dividing. So you can see here, cell one has already broken apart, cell three has already broken apart, and cell four is a cluster, and then it's starting to line up, okay? So when you look over here right away, you know that the answer is either gonna be cell two or cell four. So that means answer choice F can be crossed out and H can be crossed out. It's either cell two or cell four. Now here, it looks like they're lining up. This is the cluster and this is the lineup. So cell four is gonna be the correct answer on this one. It's J for problem number four. Yikes, kids. Problem number five, first thing you do, read and underline what's important. Which cell in figure three, let's underline that, that's the location, is the phase of mitosis during which the chromosomes initially align along the metaphase plates. We're gonna underline that, initially align along the plates, okay? Now let's go ahead and point, let's find figure three. Here it is right here, okay? And then I'm looking over here, I'm looking for initial alignment of the metaphase plate. I look up here and I'm like, okay, cell three, four, two, eh. I don't really know. Well, it's probably cell one because that's the first cell, all right? Wait. I'm not sure, so instead of guessing, we're gonna yikes out. That means go ahead, take a look at the text area. Here, when you come up here in the text area, we notice there's a pirate flag on line three. So we circle that. Pirate flags tell you important, weird stuff is going on there. And entry choices have a tendency in reading and in science to fall around those areas. So we simply circle the word however, then we read it. The cells are not arranged in order of the phases, okay? All right, well, that throws that theory out the window. Now I go back and I read the question again. In figure three, which is the initial alignment, okay? Alignment means it's like a straight line, right? Line, alignment, okay? And initial would be the first. So does this over here in cell four look like this is the initial line? Does it look like it's in a line? Not really. And over here, this is in a line, this is in a line, and this is starting to form a line. So I feel like when you have a cell that's dividing through mitosis, 
it probably would go like this, start here with solve for, a line in the middle, and then separate here, and then separate further and kind of cluster, and it looks like these two cells now are starting to grow into different cells, okay? So here's the chromosomes pulling apart. So the initial alignment would be here in cell two. That's going to give you answer choice B for problem five. Problem number six, first thing you want to do is underline what's important as you read the question. According to figure one, underline that. The pattern of DNA bands produced by sample M, underline sample M, most closely matches the pattern produced by which DNA samples, okay? So then I glance at my answers, and now I know where I'm looking for these suspects one through four, okay? Now, with my other hand, I'm going to simply go ahead and point to what I have. My right hand is on figure one in the question, and now my left hand jumps up over here, and I find figure one. Here it is just above me, okay? The next thing that I would do is I would point to the second thing here. I would find sample M. In figure one, where's sample M? I'm just start looking around for sample M. There it is right here, okay? That's the first column. All right. Then down over here with my right hand, I just simply drop my finger down, and we're looking for which one of these sample suspects matches sample M. In my own mind, that means what I'm looking for is something that replicates the exact same thing as sample M. I know that it's going to be one of these four suspects. So my left finger is going to be on sample M, and I just look. There's two, there's one, there's one, there's two, there's one. Then what I do is with my other finger, I just look over here and try and replicate it. Here is suspect one, two, three, and four. You can see that the suspect is going to be identical M to one of these and just find it, okay? So here it looks like this is going to be the same here and here. If you drag your finger down, you should have two fingers and your two fingers should match M and two. You're going to see there's two there, there's two there, one there, one there, one there, one there. There's two there, two there, and then one at the bottom. So M is a mirror image of suspect two, and when you drop your fingers down in the answer choice, you're going to see that six produces the answer G as in goat for six. Problem number seven, if you got this one wrong, this is a yikes problem, all right? First thing you want to do is read and underline. Are the data in table one consistent with the hypothesis of suspect four who they think may have stolen the painting, okay? So right away, I go ahead and find where table one is. Here it is right here, okay? And then now suspect four. So here's table one. Let's find four, okay? Suspect four looks like suspect four has blood type of an O, all right? Now, I'm a little confused as far as who the person stole the painting. So I'm going to yikes out. When I come down over here, I see that it says DNA from the amp the sample M, right? So what's the sample M? It says the museum sample, okay? So the museum sample is the blood they found inside the museum. And so that comes back up to table one. Since I yiked out and I figured out what the heck sample M was, sample M is found in the museum. And so now they're trying to match the museum blood to the sample of the suspects, okay? So here it is in table one again. Sample M has a blood type of an O. And here we're asked if suspect four would actually match that. Here is sample four, suspect four, and they have the same blood type. So the answer is yes. Is the hypothesis that suspect four stole the painting correct? Yes, because the mystery sample found in the museum was O and suspect four is O. So the answer is yes. We can cross out A and B. All right, so they have the same blood type. It's answer choice C. Suspect four is the same blood type as sample um, C for problem number seven. Problem number nine, read the problem underline what's important. It says during gel electrophoresis, DNA fragments moved towards underline that, moving towards, electrode, underline that, shown at the bottom of figure one, okay? So bottom of figure one, we underline that as well. We're looking, therefore, for the charge of the DNA fragments, okay? I quickly glance at my answers and see subgenius mapping, just look at the first word, positive, positive, negative, negative, okay? So let's go ahead and point. Figure one, we're going to go ahead and find the electrode at the bottom, all right? We simply go up and find figure one. There it is. Figure one is right here. Okay. And now we're going to find electrodes at the bottom. Okay. So here it is right here. The electrode at the bottom is positive. Okay. 
And so think, if we have something moving towards the bottom of the electrode charge, let's try and figure that out. When you look at your answer choices, if it's moving down towards the bottom, which is positive, okay, and we have an electrical charge or a positive charge, okay, electrical, positive or negative. So think, opposite charges, do they repel or do they attract, okay? Think about magnets. A magnet is going to attract opposites. You've heard that old saying, opposites attract. Since the bottom moving towards the bottom electrode is positive, that means that we must have had a charge that was negative. Answer choice A and B both can be knocked out of there. Okay, so now why? Negative because opposites charge attract each other. C is the correct answer for problem number nine. Problem number 11 is a very tough problem. Watch how easy this is to solve when we use a couple geniusy techniques here, okay? First of all, you're gonna notice the trap on the test this is a long question. The question is about six lines of text. Whenever you see this, you always wanna go directly to the bottom to make sure you understand the question itself. It's gonna say according to blah, 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 or based on this information or whatever. Okay, here it is, here's the question. It says based on table one. The genotype of suspect one could be which of the following, all right? So now what we wanna do is circle that, okay? We're gonna to go to table one, we're gonna find suspect one. When you glance at your answer choices, you see B, A, and you see big I, little I, all right? So the first thing that we wanna do is go to table one, and when we go to table one, we're gonna go ahead and look for suspect number one, all right? So here it is right here. Here's table one, so I simply take my left hand and I point to table one. The second thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna point to suspect one. Drop your finger down, here's suspect one. And you're gonna notice that with your other finger or alien finger, just draw a line here or use two fingers, you're gonna see that suspect one produces a blood type of B, all right? Now when you come back over here to the answers, just simply look over here. We're looking for something that's B, all right? Obviously, answer choice two right here can be out because there's no B involved, okay? That can be out right away. Now, something about genetics is you're gonna see we'll have big letters and small letters, okay? So big letter is something that represents something that's dominant. It's a gene that's gonna be expressed and something that's gonna be lowercase is gonna be recessive or it's going to be non expressed, okay? So if we have B, that means anything with a B on here is gonna be expressed. Here it is here, this will be expressed, three, and one will be expressed because both of those are gonna be dominant genes with the B blood type, which is suspect one. Answer choice two here doesn't work because there's no B in there, all right? So that means one is correct and three is correct, when you drop your finger into the answer choices, that gives you the correct answer of C. Notice how we didn't even read that first part up here. We didn't need to. We just kind of understood what we we're looking for when we looked at the answers. Remember, start with the question itself. It's the last sentence of the question when it's super long. Problem number 12, once again, read the question, underline what's important based on the results in the trials. We're gonna add an additional trial. That means we're gonna have to guesstimate, okay? And the new information they're gonna give us, it's M60 and R100. Then we're gonna put the KE at point EU, and we're looking for the answer choices, which is gonna have to have the value for the um, units of measure will be J, all right? So let's go back over here, find M. Here's M, and now we're gonna put 0.60, oh, right, that's gonna be at the bottom, would be our new trial. And then over here, it's 1.0, oh, that's right here, all right? So that would be at the bottom. And when we do that, we're looking for the unit of measure, which is J, and where J comes from is right here, okay? So you just simply go across. If you increase your mass, you're gonna see that our KE value is going to be larger than 0.25, and that's gonna give you answer choice J. It's just basically guesstimating. Problem number 13, first thing you wanna do is read and underline. It says the results from trials one through three indicate that the radius of the loop increased, the minimum height 
at point S required the cart would completely go through what? Okay, so let's go ahead. We're going to take a look at table one. And we know that we've got radius and height. So let's find radius. Here it is here. And height is right here. All right. Whenever we're comparing columns like this, you want to go ahead and use your arrows. Remember, if you were to shoot an arrow at a target, you would want to go for the bullseye and you get big points or bigger numbers when you shoot for the bullseye. So here, find the small number and shoot your arrow towards the big number. 0 0.8, 0 0.08 is less than 0 0.1. So we go small to big. And then over here, we say 0 0.25 is smaller than 0 0.325. You draw your arrow from the small to the big. Now you simply look at your arrows and see that you're going in the same direction. So the correct answer on this one is going to be answer choice A. You're going from small to big, increasing. 13A, use arrows. Problem number 14, it's another long question. You always want to start with the question itself. Let's go ahead and just read this. All right. Make sure you understand the question first. Which of the trials, if any, was the TME conserved while the cart rolled from point S point U. All right. So here's point S and here's point U. All right. So that's where we're pointing. And then now we're going to go ahead and read this because this is going to give us a definition of conservation of energy or what TME means. All right. Total mechanical energy. Okay. So that's defined. All right. Is conserved if the mechanical energy of the object has the same value. All right. So reword this, we're looking for S and U to have the same value, all right? So you glance down here, it says trial one, trial three, all of the trials are none of the trials. So look over here, do they have the same value? No, no, it's point, uh, point 0.073 and point 0.047, no. Point 0.083, no, does not match point 0.053. Point 0.092 does not match point 0.059. These numbers are not the same anywhere, so the answer is going to be J. Problem number 15, go ahead and read the question, underline what's important. In trial 3, underline that. At the same time, the carts release, carts release, underline that. We're looking for the TME was closest to which value. You simply look down over here and you see that you have joules on this end here. All right, so let's find trial 3. Here it is right here, okay? So it looks like it's point. 030 kilograms. R is 1. It looks like the height is 0.312 and so forth. Okay. Now, here's the trick on this one. Here, it's a yikes problem. When I look at this, I'm not really sure which column I'm looking for. So, we're looking for the cart's release. Now, we yikes out and we go up to figure 1 and we look at the release position. The release position is at the top of the ramp here. You see it up here? Okay, so the top of the ramp is point S. So that tells us in trial three, when we go back down to table one, we go trial three and we have to scan over to the S value because S is the release. Then you see that the numbers here are 0 0.092 and then we spot check to make sure that we have the same value of J joules up here. You see PE joules. So it's gonna be trial three at value point S, it's 0 0.092, and you simply come over and you see 15. The correct answer gives us that value, which is D as in dog. 15, it's yikes. When you point to table one, you're not really sure what to do, so we need to go ahead and finger scan for where the cart's released from. Remember, you're probably not going to release the cart from the bottom. It's always going to be. Problem number 16, it says, which of the following ranks the points... S, T, and U in order from which the points of the speed of the cart was the slowest, okay? So we're going to underline slowest points S, T, and U, okay? Right away, what we're going to do is we need to try and figure out what's going on here, okay? I just quickly glance over here off the top of my head, and I see that we've got S, T, and then I'm looking for U, and I'm really, I'm a little bit confused. Do you see that? That means right away I have to convert over to yikes. That means finger scan. So I immediately go up to the top and, hey, there's a diagram in figure one. Now I can see S, T, and U. And think about it, okay? So S 
is the top of the ramp, and at the top of the ramp, the cart is stationary. It's not released yet, okay? T is down at the bottom, okay, where it's got all the speed. It's probably the highest speed. And then U is all the way up here where it's starting to slow down and then going to increase again, okay? So think, which one would be the slowest? The slowest would be at the top before it gets released. The fastest would be T, all right? So we know the slowest is S. Uh, the fast, the slowest is S and the fastest is T. So let's go ahead. We're looking for the slowest. Okay. So it says F is slowest S and here G. So we know that H and J are both out. And then we simply look at G. G says T is going to be the fastest because that's at the bottom of the incline where the most speed would be. All right. G is the correct answer. It's a yikes problem, kids. Remember, when you look over here, none of this really makes sense. You're in the wrong area, so you're going to have to finger scan. In this case, we finger scanned actually in the figure, but we still finger scanned for these terms in the question, S, T, and U. Problem number 18, this particular question here, what we're going to do is we're just going to simply estimate. The question says the primary alcohol, one hexanol, has a chemical formula of... CH3, CH2, O5, OH, and table 1. What is the new one, which is 1 hexanol? We're looking for the boiling point. So we're going to underline what's important here, which would be this boiling point, table 1, and 1 hexanol with this stuff here. Then we simply just come over here to find table 1. Here it is here. And then we just add this stuff up. So it's like CH3, and then we've got... CH35, okay, so there's two, three, four. Oh, it would be right down here at the bottom, so we're just going to simply estimate, okay? So we go from 118 to 138, so you know it would be greater than 138. So you look at your answer choices here, and you see it's going to be, G is going to be too low, and F is going to be too low. And then you just look at the difference between adding one more of these CH3 groups, it goes from 118 to 138, so it's not going to be answer choice J. That's too big. So the correct answer for number 18 is going to be answer choice H for 18. Problem number 19, go ahead and read the question. Which of the alcohols listed in table 1? We're looking for the lowest freezing point. Okay, let's go ahead and find it. Here's table 1. All right, lowest is going to be the smallest number. And now here's where we have a problem. Freezing point is what we're looking for, but when we look over here, the options are boiling or melting. So you have to throw this into a Scooby-Doo synonym. When something freezes, does it boil? When something freezes, does it melt? Well, flip it around. When something melts, is it melting because it was unfreezing or was it unboiling? Oh, okay. So melting point is a Scooby-Doo synonym. And see how we just went one direction and then just flipped it around? So here's the column that we're looking for, all right? And now we're looking for the lowest number. And the lowest number is going to be a negative number. It's 126. That's going to be one propanol, and that will give you the answer choice B here for 19. Problem 20, according to figure 2, we'll go ahead and underline that. At 20 degrees Celsius, a viscosity of methanol solution at 10%. Underline that, methanol at 10%. Has a mass closest to the viscosity of which of the following methanols? All right. So now we're going to go ahead and point. We underline what's important. Okay, so let's go ahead and find figure 2. Here it is here. And then now with your other hand, let's find 10%. 10%. There it is, right here. And then we want to try and find what other, okay? So here we do. We go up and find methanol. That's the line there. So let's go up till we hit that line. Boom. And then we're going to find has equal to what percent. So you just come over here. All right, because it touches that line again there. And then you just look down here and it's 70. So the answer on this one is going to be answer choice H. Problem 21, it says according to figure 1, underline that, does ethanol or propanol, ethanol or propanol, underline that, flow more easily at 25? Okay, underline that, underline that.
All right, let's go ahead and simply point. We're going to go ahead and find figure one. Here it is here. And then we're going to find ethanol. Looks like that's there. And propanol. Okay. And then we're going to find 25. So 25 is here. And then we go up, boom, and up, boom. Okay. And which one flows more easily? All right. Now we have to look at the xy axis. Here is viscosity. And here's temperature. This one here, methanol has a lower viscosity. And this one is weird because usually they will define that. But through Junior Genius Cultural Coding doing practice problems, viscosity basically just kind of sounds like osity. It's kind of just reminds me of like scruffy scuffing. So this is just the flowing rate, how thick something is. For example, water versus maple syrup, okay? So maple syrup is going to have a higher viscosity, all right? Oil in the wintertime versus oil in the summertime, all right? Since methanol has a lower viscosity, the correct answer is going to be ethanol, and that's exactly what you're going to see, so it's B on that one. Please take a note, if you do see something with viscosity, it's just basically like how thick it is and the ability for it to flow and how fast it would flow. All right. Problem 22, the results in experiment 2 best represented by which of the following graphs. Okay, so we'll go over here and take a look. Simply scroll up to experiment 2. And here it is right here. All right. So if we were to come over and we were to draw some arrows, we're going to shoot our arrow head towards the target, which is the bullseye. You probably get more points if you shoot to the big number. All right. Start it small and go to the large. So there it is, 1.5 to 3.50. Then over here, we're going to find the small number. Here it is here. And then boom. All right. When we do that, you see that the arrows are opposite. So when we go back to take a look at the graph or chart, it's got to have those arrows going opposite. Okay, so right away you can see that this choice here, this is increasing. That's going up, so that's opposite. That would be represented by arrows going in the same direction. That is arrows going in the same direction as well. Okay, so those two are out. Then here it looks like we go to 2 or 2.03. And we saw from that chart that it goes to just under 2. So it doesn't go above 2. So the correct answer on this one, it's going to be answer choice G for problem number 22. Problem 25, don't forget, underline what's important. We've got experiment 1 and 2 in the direction of the current flowing. The circuit is determined by which of the following, okay? So right away when you see something that talks about experiment 1 and 2, I feel like this is kind of like a big picture thing. So I usually just check at the very top in the mini introductory paragraph, okay? And so here is our current and it says there's a magnetic field and there's a magnet. All right. So when we go back down over here, we're looking for an answer choice that's going to basically restate that. What's happening with the direction? The correct answer on this one is going to be answer choice C because we have a magnet. Yikes is what you call this type of a problem. Remember, Big picture questions, you probably have to finger scan in that mini introductory paragraph. If you can't answer the question, you're looking around everywhere, just convert over to picking something in the question that feels like, um, you know, circuit, flowing, direction, those words, and then just finger scan for it. Seize the answer for 25, yikes. All right, 26, it's a lot of words, it's confusing, so let's go ahead and take a look at this. Suppose the current had flowed in the same direction in three as it did in two, okay? Here's the question. Based on the results of one and two with a length segment of 2.0, what's the reading, okay? So now we have to go ahead and make sure we understand this. We are going to flow in experiment three 
we're going to switch it so it's going in the direction that they did in experiment two. Okay, so let's go back up and look at that. All right. So here are experiments. So here is three. And here's two. So here it tells us we're reversing this. Okay. And now we have experiment three, but we're going to do experiment three in the same direction as two. So here we are. We have a line segment of 2.0. But here's the thing that we yikes out. Okay. Experiment three is what we're working on. We have to find experiment three with a line segment, which is kind of throwing you off a little bit. That line segment has to be 2.5 okay for your ampage and we're going to do that in the same as what we do but it's the direction of experiment two so now we come up here and we find this 2.0 i use the alien finger to draw it over and you see that my number is uh, 1.99804 so i've got to find an answer choice near that 804 when you come back down over here you look for an answer choice that is 199804 so that's too big two twos and then 804 so this is the one that's the closest right here all right 26 G all right problem number 27 this is a basic science concept so let's go over this before the horseshoe magnet was placed on the scale in experiment one the scale read zero okay after the students placed the magnet on the scale, there was no uh, current flowing through this. What does the student have to do after you place the magnet on the scale? See how I just reworded that? Now it's easier for you to understand. So when you have a scale and it reads zero, then you put a magnet on top of it. The magnet has weight. On your little scale, you have to clear that out to go back to zero, which is called tearing. Okay. So the correct answer on this one is you're going to have to add the weight of the magnet called tearing, clearing it out, A27. All right, in this passage here, it's conflicting viewpoints, and what we want to do here is do a lot of finger scanning, okay? So problem number 28, it says according to scientist one, we're talking about CO2 concentrations at a constant rate since 2000, okay? CO2 concentration for... 2000 in figure one and it's asking us co2 concentration in 2002 so what we want to do is we want to simply just go ahead and find figure one and try and estimate where 2002 would particularly be all right so when we come over here we go back here's our figure one here and let me just scroll one second okay so here we go and here is figure one and here's 2000 all right so you see that in 2000 we're roughly at 360. now this is the part where we have to finger scan for so remember we're dealing with scientist number one all right here is a pirate flag down here it says the word since okay and this tells us that information is going to be important it says since 2000 the atmosphere co2 concentration has been increasing at 1.5 percent now remember the question asks us about 2002 that's two years so two years and one year is 1.5 percent so we're looking at a three percent increase over a two-year period so do some simple math 3% of 360 gives you roughly like 11 okay so 360 plus 11 that gives you 371 now we're looking for an answer choice that gives you right around that okay scroll on down and you see that that would give you answer choice H 370 H for 28 Problem number 29, it's kind of a long question here, so I usually start with the question itself down over here. I just quickly put a circle around it and then make sure I understand what they're asking me. To support the assertion, scientist two would most likely cite which temperature data from figure two for the following times, okay? So scientist two is gonna support their theory and they're gonna look at figure two and temperature, all right? 
Now we come over to the question that says, suppose scientist two um, said that there's been times over the past 160,000 years which the average global temperature has been higher. Okay, so average global temperature being higher and what we're going to do is we're going to find that in figure two. So it's a long question, pretty easy once you break it down and let's go ahead and take a look at figure two. Here we are, figure two, all right, and we're looking for global temperature in years. Here's years and here's global temperature. So we're looking for the higher parts, okay? So here is something high around 280 and then up here we see that we're at Oh, 270 or something like that. And here's the uh, uh, deviation on this one. Okay, so let's look. We're looking for something like right around here for an answer. And here is present day. Okay, so that's probably not it. So it's probably going to be somewhere right around here, which we said is around 135 to 140 years. Let's look at our answer choices. Scroll back down. See the trap on this test, it's basically, yeah, there it is right there. See how easy this is? It's just basically weeding through the words. It's all about Scooby Doo. B is the answer on this one. All right. Remember, when you get a long question like this, break it down into the question itself, read and understand what they're asking us. And then sometimes you may look next at your answer choices just to kind of see and preview. Then maybe you would look up at the data itself and then maybe what you would do is you'd come back and read this so you get three different systems um, to go ahead and do it out of order so just make sure that you understand the question but first you got to break it up and understand the question itself 29 problem 30 read the question underline what's important scientist one states that today's atmosphere co2 concentration is higher than any time in the past 160,000 years in figure one. Is this true? Yes or no? All right. So let's go ahead and see figure one and see if it talks what they talk about here. All right. Here it is right here. And remember, it's the highest it's ever been in the past 160,000 years. Here we go, figure one. And then now you see that we go from 1,000 to 2,000. That's only 1,000 years. So the answer on that one is going to be no because this figure one only is 1,000 years, so it's not 160,000 years. And so let's simply go back to that question and cross out the yeses. So we'll get the yeses out of there. And no figure shows past 1,000 years, it's J, all right? Problem 31, underline what's important as you read it. According to figure two, which of the following time intervals did the average Global temperature increase more than five times as much as scientist one claims. Okay, so first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to go ahead and take a look and see what did scientist one claim. All right, so let's scroll back up here and here we go. Scientist one, right here, we've seen this before with the pirate flag since. It says one year, 2000, the atmosphere increased 1.5% per year. All right, so that's what they say. And now we're going to look in the time period that's five times more than that. Okay, so if you look over here, you're looking for basically like a huge gap. Okay, so I look at figure two now, and here's our figure two. And I see that at 20,000 years, we're way down here. And then here is present day. We're way up here. So I know the answer is going to entail something really large. Okay. So that's where we have that there. And then also at 160, that's something going on there. So you see what I did? I just kind of pointed out, underlined some stuff. Now let's go to the answers and see which one pops off the page. All right. We'll zap back down over. So we had 20 or 160. And all right, so here we go 80,000 years, 60, 20, right there. That's the answer. All right, so to confirm this, 40, 60, and 80, if you were just to go back over and look at that, that's 40, 60, and 80. So that's roughly 
here. So that's not going to work. D is the answer on this one. Problem 32, which of the following statements about atmospheric CO2 concentration would be supported by scientists to underline what's important. Now we're looking for CO2 concentration in scientist two. So a good place to look in scientist two would be the topic sentence for sure. So here we are, it's right here. And let's have a look. So here we go, here's scientist two. I look at the topic sentence. Global warming is a process of blah, blah, blah. In general, that's our pirate flag tells you that something important is probably going to be said there. Um, increase and decrease on average global temperature results from increase and decrease. So it's a direct relationship. If it increases, it increases. If it decreases, it decreases. We just scooby-doo that into the answer choices. And when we look down over at the choices for 32, let's cross out the ones that are opposite. Here it says increase and decrease. That's out. Here it says remain the same. That's not true. And here it says it's changed only with burning a fossil fuel. Nope. And here it says as it increases, it increases. That's what you saw. G is the correct answer on that one. Once again, pirate flags do use them again in science all the time. Problem number 34. Assume that present day average global temperature is 22. All right. In figure two, the two scientists would likely claim the average global temperature 140,000 years ago would be what? Okay, so here's what we have. We'll just summarize it right now. It's 22. So a long time ago, 140,000 years, what was it? Now let's go back up and have a look at our figure two. All right. See what I did? I just kind of scooby dooed it into something that's a little bit easier to understand. All right, so present day right here is zero. And we're up here, okay? And we roughly said that that's just, they're giving some estimates, 22 Celsius. All right, so we have to find 140. Let's go to 140. Here it is here. And here it is right here. So it's way lower. Make sense? It's got to be below 22 degrees Celsius by a considerable amount. All right, let's go to the answers and just use a little bit of kid logic. When we come over and look at our answer choices, we know present day was way up there at 22. And so it can't be higher than 22. It's got to be lower. So 27 and 24 are out. Okay. But we're at 22 and it's like half of that. So 21 is too close. The only answer choice that makes sense because it's so low, you saw where you looked at that scale originally, it's got to be 18, answer choice F, 18 degrees Celsius. Problem 35, this is going to be one of our conflicting viewpoints passages, so it's important that you just make sure you get a general idea of what's going on. Here's your mini introductory paragraph. Find out what's going on in the last sentence and then look for the difference. Okay, here, underline what's important in the question. How, if at all, would the results have been different if the dialysis bag with pores large enough for the H2O iodine, iodate, uh, starch molecule had passed through used in experiment two? So underline what's important. Experiment two, I'd underline that. H2O I2, iodate. And then we have pores. Okay, so now let's go back over and find experiment two. So here it is here, okay? And here it says a dialysis bag contains starch solution in the beaker containing the iodate, okay? And then it says after one hour, the bag shrunk. The solution in the bag was blue, okay? That's important, okay? While the appearance on the outside did not change, okay? And that's a bag that did not have pores or holes. Holes is a Scooby-Doo synonym for pores. So think, if we had this turn blue and there was holes in the bag, probably that would leak out, okay? So come back over here, answer choice A. It said the dialysis bag would have swollen and burst. That's not what it says there. Down over here, it says in experiment two that it shrunk. You see it on line three, shrunk. That's out, A is out. B says it's reddish brown. That's not true at all because here it says it's blue according to experiment two, that can be out. C says it's blue color, which would have appeared 
on the inside and in the beaker. That would make sense because of the pores. Okay, put a dot by that. And then D says the results would not have been different, which is wrong. Answer choice C for 35. It's basically when you're dealing with conflicting viewpoints, just finger scan. Problem number 36, experiment one and two. What did the beakers contain before the submersion of the dialysis bag? All right. Quite easy, you just come on in here and just look. I glance at my answers, I see that we've got starch, iodate, diluted water, all right? So let's go in, scientist experiment one, here it is here. It says uh, dialysis bag contains this iodate solution submer submerged in starch. See it right there? Submerged. So that would tell you that we're gonna deal with starch, so that would be it. So we're F and G, and then now we're going to look for experiment two. And we come down over here, and it says containing a starch solution was submerged in a beaker containing iodate. So we're going to find iodate is here. Answer choice F. How easy is that? Problem 37. Problem 37, experiment one. Before the dialysis bag was placed in the beaker, the solution of the bag was what? Okay. So experiment one, here it is right here. Okay. And it says here, sealed bag, dialysis bag containing this iodate. All right. Now here's the trick. You got to go back up here, find where that is. All right. Here it says iodate solution, right? Right here. That's it. An iodate solution is reddish brown. So that's our solution. So the answer is going to be C on that one. This is a yikes problem, kids. Yikes for sure, because you're going to have to go into the mini intro. Problem number 38, it's a yikes problem. So let's go ahead and take a look. It says chemists claim that since the solution both inside and outside of the bag was reddish brown in color, in experiment three, that the molecules must be bigger than H2O, okay? So just a quick review. We have a bag inside a beaker, and it said that now we have both on the inside and on the outside of the dialysis bag, it's reddish brown. So what we need to do is we need to go and see, finger scanning style, what the heck makes something reddish brown okay so i go up here and start looking around in the mini introductory paragraph and i see up here right here reddish brown all right see how i was finger scanning for it it says a starch solution is milky white an iodate solution is reddish brown okay so now we know that on the inside and the outside of the dialysis bag we have both iodates on the in and outside. So here's your beaker. And then on the inside of the beaker, there's the dialysis bag. And on both inside and outside, it's brown. So if there's pores, okay, or holes in the dialysis bag, that tells you that this iodate is able to go in and out of those pores. So does that make it bigger than water? No. If it was bigger than water, it wouldn't go in there, and therefore it would only be on one side where the iodate would be because it's not going through what we call in science a permeable membrane. Okay? Now we've got two answer choices, and let's just read both of them. No, the results only show that iodate and water molecules are smaller than the pores, in the dialysis bag. Well, if they're smaller than the pores, both of them, then they would both be able to pass in and out. Does that make sense? So that makes sense. All right. J, know the results show that iodate and water molecules would be larger. If they were indeed larger, they would not be able to permeate through the pores. And so there would be just the reddish brown on one side, whether it's in or outside the dialysis bag. H is the correct answer on that one. And once again, you see that we yiked out and we yiked out for this word here, reddish brown, 
we found that way up here in the mini introductory paragraph just to kind of get our uh, bearings. H for 38. Problem 39, we're going to do a new scenario here. We're going to have sugar molecules. And these sugar molecules do not pass through the dialysis bag. That means that the sugar molecule is larger than the pore or the hole in the dialysis bag. Okay. So now we know that the sugar molecule is colorless and it's dissolved in the water in experiment three. So I come over here because it says experiment three and I just look and see what it says. We've got this iodate and remember from previous questions that iodate from way up here is the reddish brown. All right, that's what we have, but this is being changed to the new scenario, which is the sugar, okay? And it's in the beaker with the water. After one hour, the bag is swollen, okay? So keep that in mind, all right? And it says on the inside and the outside, okay? So this is what we have in experiment three. It gets swollen, and then it's on the inside and the outside. It's going through the pores, all right? So first of all, when we give the new thing on the inside of the dialysis bag as sugar, it's colorless. So if you look over here, reddish brown, that's getting you confused because that's not, you just don't even have iodate where I have sugar. So that's out, okay? Over here it says swollen. So swollen is gonna be a Scooby-Doo synonym for swell. So we can go ahead and see answer choice D says shrink. And answer choice B says shrink. Swollen and swell say the same thing, Scooby-Doo wise. How easy is that? Kids, you see what we're doing? We're just linking up nouns and verbs pretty much the whole test. Don't get afraid of this stuff. You haven't had this stuff, chances are in school. And so I haven't had this stuff either. I'm just kind of looking to try and match up the nouns and the verbs. You see that we just basically focus in on key words. And then if we need something, we'll go read a little bit more in the technique we call it yikes. 39A. All right. And for the last problem, problem number 40, it's a tricky problem. We're going to yikes out on this guy. All right. So we have experiment one and two. We're looking for starch molecules. Okay. And we're looking to see where they can move to, okay? Can they go in and out of the bag? Can they not go in and out of there, all right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna finger scan for starch. And since it's talking about experiment one and two, the best place to find this is gonna be in the mini introductory paragraph. Once again, here's our mini introductory paragraph. It's just above the italicized part that says experiment one. And we're looking for starch, okay? I'll notice over here that here's a pirate flag right here, the word therefore. But yet, however, although, on the other hand, those words are going to be pirate flags, but also don't forget about thus, in conclusion, therefore, since, moreover, words that suggest there's some type of a transition going on. Here is a conclusion. Here it says the starch solution had a higher concentration of water than did the iodate solution. So what do we know about that? Okay. In the bag, when there's a high concentration of what they said here of water, that means we have our permeable membrane, which is our dialysis bag. And since there's a high concentration of water, that means that water is able to get in there, right? And water is going to be able to get in there and swell, all right? But that starch molecule is not going to be able to get out. It's going to be stuck inside. Okay, and remember down over here, it says the starch solution here is milky white. So in the dialysis bag, you still have the milky white starch. It can't get out because the molecule is larger than the pore. However, water can get in there, all right? So we're putting the pieces together and you see basically what I did here is a Scooby-Doo it again, okay? When you come down to the answer choices, you know that starch can't go in or out so what happens? The molecules were able to move where? They can't go in, nor can they go out of the dialysis bag because the molecule of the starch is too large. J is the correct answer on that one. Kids, thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.